is how do we go from having uh, decision trees um, to which are very simple classifiers which often if you have noise tend to make erroneous decisions to actually having very power classifiers uh, known as random forests. So it's pretty much state of the art in terms of classification. So in this very last lecture I'm going to talk about how you go from trees to random forests. Uh, I will explain to you how you would build an object detector, essentially how this face detecting your cameras works. Um, and also we'll talk about how the Kinect sensor works. Um, so again the setup is we have data and we're interested in classification. Uh, we'll assume that um, throughout this lecture that the data is a point in 2D. So each, each vector, each input point is a, has two dimensions. And I will assume that each node, say the jth node, splits the data into left date and right date. Okay. And at each node we can compute just by seeing how many data points of each color are there in the node, we can uh, compute the probability of each class given the input. Okay. So how do we deal with this continuous data when we don't have a spreadsheet but what we're given is a data set of points in 2D and we want to classify them. And in this case we want to classify them into four classes. So um, let's assume we have two nodes. In this case we don't have all the columns given to us or the, the attributes in the spreadsheet but in this case we're actually going to create those columns. The most obvious way to create uh, decisions is to consider a vertical line and a horizontal line. Okay. Now if we had the option of a vertical line in the middle and a horizontal line in the middle, so in other words this horizontal line and this vertical line, um, then we would see that the horizontal line tends to have a few reds still on top. It has some blues, has some yellows, there's no greens on top. Um, and at the bottom is mostly green, and blue, um, red and blue. The vertical line seems to be doing a bit of a better job because the vertical line put all the greens and the blues on one side and the reds and yellows on the other side. Okay, so the vertical boundary seems to split. At least it's able to tell apart two classes quite well. How do we choose between uh, whether to use a vertical line or a horizontal line? Well, we just do this. We compute the entropy. Um, and then we compute the reduction in entropy. So we know the entropy of the top. So we can compute the entropy um, of the entire data set. And then this is just the proportion of points in each of the two leaves, left or right. Because essentially what we're doing is, So that's left, this is the right leaf and then the right, each of these two children corresponds to one of the two divisions of the data and then this would be the entropy of the children. But if we know the, if we can calculate their entropy, then we compute the information gain and that decides whether we use this or this. In this case, the, the information gain of uh, split two is higher than the information gain of one. And the exact calculation appears in this paper, at the exact numerical calculation. And essentially that's all we need to know in order to construct the tree. Go ahead. The index J is that the level tree? Uh, that will be for node J. Thanks for the question, because I'm going to be using it. No, no, no. The, you're at node J. J is the, just the name of the node. Before I, used, before I was using names like patrons and salary and stuff like that. But now my nodes are just indexed by a variable J. And so node, think of this as node J. Node J is trying to split this date. Um, so this is the J node. This is my variable. And so my J node has two options. It can go to the left or it can go to the right. All the points in node J, all the data in node J, instead of me drawing these circles, I'm just going to 
say that my data in node J is denoted by SJ. So SJ is essentially a bag that has all of this data in fact. Okay. And then I'm going to go to SJ left, the left children for node J, and then the right uh, chill, the, the, the points that were left on the right hand side. So every time a point visits node J, I check is it greater than, let's put a threshold here, 0 0.2. Is the point greater than 0 0.2? I put it on the right. Is it less than 0 0.2? I put it on the left. And so if I use this, then all my blue and green points will be on one side and my yellow and red points will be on the other side. So I know this is just a decision that compares the, the horizontal um, coordinate x, say x1, against the threshold and decides in which side to put, uh, in which side to send the data. And so this is just the number of points that fell on the right or left leaf divided by the total number of points. So in other words, it's the probability of going left or right. And this is just the entropy of the children. So once again, it's the entropy of the root minus the expected entropy of the children, and that's the reduction in entropy. When you had your entropy, entropy is uncertainty. So this was my original uncertainty. I subtract the uncertainty of uh, my children, and what is this uncertainty that's left when I do that? How useful was it to split the data this way? And this reduction in uncertainty is uh, information gain, is how much you became much more informed about the decision. Okay. And it's possible to do this for Gaussians. I, I don't cover it in this course, um, but if you have Gaussians, currently we're using splits as the decisions, but it's possible to just use actually full Gaussian distributions and you can also compute information gain for Gaussian distributions. And then you can say that this is better than this because it separates the data better. Um, if you take 540, and if you got an A for this course, I strongly recommend you take 540, especially if you enjoyed the subject, then I will go over this in detail over there. Okay, so, um, so we know that um, Essentially, our decisions, our attributes now are either horizont a horizontal line or a vertical line. But obviously, you would think there could be more than one horizontal line or, or vertical line. So I could use this line, but I could have also used this line or this line or this line or this line. Okay. So essentially, what we're doing is we're now going to have a huge family of such lines and the the parameter that determines exactly where that line is is going to be something that I'm going to label theta, which could be 0.1, uh, 0.2. So it's just a threshold. Okay. And then what I'm going to have, a decision node is essentially a function, in this case a line, which has different heights, different thetas. And then based on whether you're above that line or below, you're either one or zero. Or you go to the right or you go to the left. It's the same sort of thing. Okay, so that's the sort of the mathematical representation of a single node. A node is just a function that decides uh, whether you go left or right and it has a, a, a parameter theta. The parameter here is just the right, the height of the line where I place it. So, in order to train a node, in, um, in order to train a node, I will look at all my possible values of theta. Let's say that I start with uh, five values, and then I, I check which of those five values is the best one in terms of splitting the data. In other words, which one is the best one in terms of maximizing the information gain? Once again, I have an expression for information gain, and so I just basically, um, I just enumerate for each value of theta, I check which one splits the data best. 
and then I pick the best one. Okay. So that there's a sort of a way of not only picking the just vertical versus horizontal, but now we can pick many vertical, many horizontal. A typical strategy, for example, what's used in the Kinect sensor, is to just pick a bunch of random thetas, a bunch of random, and then you just have a big dictionary, and then you just go over each of them, and you pick the best. Once you have, uh, once we're done with the training, then at test time, uh, the new input comes in, and then you just check whether it's above the line or below the line. Um, if it's below the line, if it's zero, it goes to the left. If it's one, it goes to the right. And then on each leaf, we just calculate how many greens are there, how many blues, and that histogram gives us the probability of that point being classified into each of the four classes. Okay, so that's basically all of decision trees in one slide there. So everything you need to implement it is in that one slide. I completely forgot, Chuck, okay. sorry. That's all right. Um, I'll ask both of the other questions too far back. Would it make sense then to rerun it again? Like suppose now you're at a leaf where you have the greens and reds, wouldn't you want to do the whole process again with a different type of line? That seems like an obvious general Okay, question. so yes. That kind of opens up. I will tell you one very nice, way, easy, efficient way of doing that um, in a couple slides. Okay, first, um, so, so far we've seen horizontal and vertical lines. The other thing is you might choose to use a line with an angle. So you might want to use uh, a logistic classifier as the decision in each node. So each node now is basically a classifier. That's essentially the interpretation here. You have a classifier that's classifying into one or zero. So we can use horizontal vertical lines. We can use more fancy ones and more fancy ones. So, but it turns out, as, as if you're just building a single tree, it would be important to use more and more fancy ones. But as, as we will see, by using a technique uh, of using many trees, essentially, and averaging them, it will be enough to use simple trees. And the idea is the following. If you have a bunch of simple predictors, very simple classifiers, in this case just is it to the left or to the right. Um, and if you have many of these uh, classifiers, and provided that they're better than random, they're epsilon better than random, and provided that they're each unbiased, and by unbiased, I mean that if the data went to infinity, um, these classifiers would, uh, I haven't discussed base, optimal base error, so it, these classifiers would be optimal in the usual criterion. So as the data would go to infinity, they would make the right decision and they would be above random. In 540, I will make this, what I mean by optimal, very precise. I will actually go over base errors and optimal rates. Uh, but for now, let's say that provided these classifiers are unbiased, um, you know, in other words, they don't make systematic errors intuitively, and, and provided that they're just a little bit better than chance, and provided that they're different from each other, so that they're not very correlated, they could have very high variance. And they will have very high variance because I'm trying to decide whether someone has cancer or not just based on a vertical line. That's, you know, depending on where I put that line, a bit to the left, a bit to the right, I might get very different answers. Um, so, the, so the answers will have high variance. But if I average many things that have high variance, I end up with something that has low variance. That's essentially the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us that if we average many numbers, we end up with a Gaussian distribution. And moreover, we know that the central limit theorem says that the more points you add, the less the variance of that Gaussian. So in other words, just by using a sort of very simple argument, um, one sees that if you take many simple decisions and you average them, um, you will knock off the variance and you will end up 
with a very good technique. Okay? That's the sort of, in loose terms, uh, why this works. Um, in 540, I don't know if I'll get to it in 540, but certainly if you come to our reading uh, group meetings, you will see we go over these proofs all the time. Uh, what exactly do you mean by high variance? They, they, <coughs> what are we comparing to see if it's different? The, the output, of, if the distributions are different, when we have different lines? Or? Yeah, are we comparing the Oh, each classifier might give you very different, um, very different answers. If you were to perturb the classifier, um, your answer might be very di uh, different. That's what I mean by high so variance. Like, uh, it splits it, but what's in what box is mixed? Mm -hmm. oh. But uh, another way to, uh, yeah, that's the best I. Uh, Think of it, it's probably best to think of it in terms of regression. In terms of regression, you might have, you might be trying to fit this, and then you can use a high variance function, which would be something that would do this. Okay, so that would be a, a function that has high variance going through the points. It's not the best function. But, uh, but if you take one like this, and you take another one, Okay, they're all unbiased, and by unbiased, I mean that there's no systematic error. A biased one would be something that would be doing this, in which case there is a systematic error. But these, on average, are going through the points. In fact, they go precisely through the points, so their bias is zero in this case. They have high variance, though. But if I average the blue and the black line, even in this example, you already will start seeing what's going to happen. If I have enough ones, I will end up with what I want. I will end up with something that will go through the points. And that's essentially the, what I'm, in intuition, what I'm trying to communicate. When you laid out, out the theory, you actually prove this. Um, we actually start writing equations that, about the bias and the variance and so on, and, and, we, and how we control them. And here it's sort of like the variance is in, for a given data point, what class that's being assigned for the different trees. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so how do we average? We're going to be, we, in a way, if everything is the same, if my blue line and my black line were high variance, but they were exactly the same, averaging them would not have helped me. It's the fact that sometimes the blue line is up and the black line is down. In other words, provided that they're very, um, they're different, they're uncorrelated, that I can actually get something meaningful out of averaging the lines. If all my lines were like the blue line, then averaging would not allow me to get something that would be like the dashed line. Now, how do we make the classifiers different from each other? Um, Leo Bryman proposed the following strategy. Um, Leah said, first of all, let each classifier have access to a different subset of the data. Okay, so if one classifier will, for example, only see this point and this point and this point and this point. Okay, and then another classifier will see different points. Because now there's less of a chance of them being the same because they're not seeing the same data even. In addition, in order to make, and so the first step of the algorithm is what is called in statistics a, a bootstrap, which is you draw some sample from the training data with replacement, you pick a new data set. Leo and these statisticians here in the book that's on the website, they like to use the same amount of um, samples as there are training data. Um, that is not necessary. You might actually draw less samples than your training data. And, and in these days of computation, where computation and how to distribute data among machines, it's actually quite useful to have, um, to have a situation where you, you take your data, you store each chunk of your data in a different machine, 
and in RAM because reading from disk is extremely expensive. So you would put different chunks of data in RAM in different machines. And then you would essentially build a tree in each machine separately. So each tree will be looking at a different um, set of the data. Now, for each, in each machine, you grow a tree just the way we've described how we grow trees so far, which is you would pick one node, and then once you pick one node, um, you decide, you use information gained to decide how to split. However, here there's one more twist. Um, I mentioned that we could use these five red lines and we would enumerate each of the five red lines. But some of you might already have thought, why five? Why not a million red lines? Because that would give me a much nicer division. And indeed you can use a million red lines and in fact that's what Leo would recommend you do, use a million red lines. But every time you uh, make a decision in a node, just like you only picked a subset of the data, you will only pick a subset of those lines. So out of the million, you sample five. Again, the purpose is not to make each of these classifiers the best possible classifier. You don't want each of these lines to, go, to be a very nice prediction. That doesn't matter. What's important is that they are unbiased, that they go through the data, and that, when you that they are different so that when you average them, you will get the right thing. And so, uh, I'll come to you. Um, and so the idea then is you pick only a subset of the points, say five thresholds, and then out of those five thresholds, you pick the best. And that's using information gain, and that's it. That's the algorithm. That's random for So there's randomization of the data and there's randomization of the parameters. And in fact, in the connect, they don't even use, sometimes they don't even use information again. They just use full randomization. You just pick one of the thetas. And actually, that doesn't work as well, but works remarkably, surprisingly remarkably well. So I have one, two, three. Um, so when you randomly select the variables, do you replace the variables next time? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Okay, so then how can you guarantee that all your trees will be very different? I mean, randomly, yes, but there could be a chance they have they use the same variables to your class. Well, if you're choosing five out of a million for each node, and supposing you go down three levels, then the probability of picking those same five is quite low. So it has to be very small. Yeah, the, if you're a million choose a million choose five, it's pretty... So what's the percentage of uh, variables that you choose out of P variables generally? Uh, typically you might choose a hundred. So where is this useful? Each of the base classifiers could be, each of the decisions left, right, could be something like does the word Viagra appear in the email? If the answer is yes, right. If the answer is no, left. Does the word uh, paper appear in the email? If yes, left. If not, right. So each of these d attributes could be a word in English. And this is how you build random forest, in fact, for your Twitter data set. So each of your features is one of the attributes. And then you just check whether that attribute is present in the data or not. Is the word Viagra there or is it not? Um, now you would have now millions of possible words and you know, combinations of words like Brad Pitt um, in English that you would want to check. Um, it, so you don't want to use them all, but you would pick, say, 100 out of them per node. So each node has access to, say, 100 of those. So you uh, 100 of a million? Yeah, percent. roughly. It depends on the application. This is a parameter, though. You're going to be tuning this parameter by cross-validation. Yes. Yeah, it's just for my competition, I've been trying to add it. Oh, okay. You want me to help you with the competition. No, Next no, no, question. <laughs> <laughs> Classifiers should be unbiased. What do you mean by unbiased classifiers? Um, I haven't defined any of these terms unbiased 
And for now, think of unbiased as it goes, as in the context of regression, it's easier for me to explain. It goes straight through the point. In other words, the, the difference between the value of the function at the point and, and the, value, the value of the prediction, say the blue curve, is zero. There is, think of it as there is no DC, there is no, um, something like this would be biased. And even, in fact, if you look at this curve and you just copy this curve, so this curve is the optimal curve. Um, it has zero variance, it's not wobbly, but it, there is a difference here. And this difference is what I'm calling the bias. And if you were to get more and more and more data as n goes to infinity, this difference would not disappear. Because there's a systematic bias, essentially. You have chosen a different height. Okay. So biases are things that will not, by averaging with the central element theorem, will not vanish. Essentially, this. Uh, the central limit theorem says that if you look at your estimate minus the truth, um, they will be distributed. Um, the estimator is a function of n. Any estimator minus the truth are governed by this. Um, if it's unbiased, it means that this is zero here. That as n goes to infinity, there will be not, this would be yes, n goes to infinity. As n goes to infinity, um, there would be no difference between theta hat and the true theta. And then as n goes to infinity, there's always some variance, but that variance is being divided by n, so it vanishes. In 540, I will give you more details, but that's just the, the rough idea. Is this slide supposed to explain how we combine the trees to have a refinement tree? No. This, this line just tells you how you would construct each tree. So each tree looks at the portion of the data, and each tree only looks at the, a, a portion of the features. Each node in the tree only looks at the portion of the features. Okay, this is how you construct a single tree. Pardon? So you're going to have to speak up. The minimum node size, how do you decide on that? Is that to recursively repeat the process until you reach your minimum node size? Yeah, that's a parameter. I will now tell you about all these different choices and what they are. Okay, so first of all, um, we need to choose. Uh, so we pick a subset of the parameters only at each node and, and for the subset of parameters we find the best theta by maximizing information gain. Now this is answering the question of how do we combine them. Suppose you have three trees. Now for each tree you compute, you basically, you have a new test date, a new test data what you do is you, for that test data, you follow all the decisions in the tree until re you reach the, uh, the leaf. And once you've reached at the leaf, uh, each leaf has associated with it a histogram that we got from the training data, which is how many green training data were there, how many, uh, how many red, how many blue. Um, and we do that for the next tree and for the next tree. So now we now have three histograms. If you want a combined histogram, you just average those. So you average the green cells and the blue cells and the red cells and uh, um, what was it? yellow cells. So it's exactly this operation here. We just average all the classes. And that's it. So load the data separately to RAM. There, should be, there could be overlap in the data in different machines, completely parallel. Learn a tree in each machine. Of course, 
for it, learning a tree is very expensive. Learning a node, because you need to enumerate all the features. So pick a subset to keep the computation cheap. And also to make sure that these trees are all different from each other. And then at the end of the day, just average them, which is this operation here. So you average all the leaves of all the trees? That, that's correct. Oh, oh no, no. For a test data, you have now this is a test time. For each test point, you find its leaf in each tree. Okay, because that's how we classify. I have a new point, you give me a new data point. Say so you give you yourself identify yourself as the new data point. Yeah. And then I check is your height above six feet or below six feet? Is your weight above 190 pounds or not? And I keep making these decisions. And then until I reach a leaf node. And then at each of the leaves, I have the probabilities of each class, which is what I did during the training data. So during training, what is what is little t? Little t is an index over trees. Capital T is all the trees. So I'm averaging the trees. Averaging is in the usual sense. One tree plus another tree plus another tree divided by the number of trees. OK, I, let me first, let me bring back what uh, the, the tree is, because I think Let's go back to what a tree does. This is what a tree does. A tree, you give it a new image, for example, a new data vector, and then you make a few decisions. Is the top blue? Then you make a next decision. Is the part blue? Until you reach a leaf. And once you reach a leaf, you, you decide whether it's indoor or outdoor. Now, suppose I had many trees, which would have different decisions. You give me a new, pardon? Have different, different nodes. The trees will be different. Let's and they will be different because the trees have access to different data and the trees have access to different thresholds, different thetas, different features. So some trees will have the word Viagra, some trees will not have the word Viagra. So each tree will be different. Because the construction is I draw a subset of the data to construct each tree. Each tree looks at a different subset of the data. Moreover, every time I optimize a node, a node only looks at a subset of the attributes. A node does not look at all the attributes. So there's randomization. I choose, say, at random 100 out of a million. And so because of that, then each tree, if it has three levels, will not be like any other tree. 